Old Moving Castle, the 15th film to be released by Studio Ghibli, based on the book by the same name, by Diana Wayne Zones, is set in a fantastic world where magic is commonplace. The protagonist of this story sets it apart from others of the same nature, as she is a young girl, Sophie, who spends most of the narrative in the skin of an elderly woman. In a milieu where most protagonists are in the prime of their lives, this subversion captivates with its originality. But why was Miyazaki attracted to this book? And did you know that the movie wasn't originally intended to be directed by Miyazaki? Visit the towns of Komar and Rikvir in Alsace with me and walk the same streets Miyazaki did while I tell you the story behind the creation of this beautiful movie. Oz Moving Castle, a classic of my childhood, my favorite of the Ghibli films along with Spirited Away. And do you know who also has Oz Moving Castle as a favorite? Miyazaki himself, who adds that, with this film in particular, he wanted to convey the message that life is worth living. Auro no Ugokushiro, or Oz Moving Castle, premiered at the 61st Venice International Film Festival on September 5, 2004, and was released in theaters in Japan on November 20, 2004. Written and directed by Ayao Miyazaki, produced by Toshio Suzuki and distributed by Toho, Oz Moving Castle quickly became one of the studio's most successful films, winning four Tokyo Anime Awards and the Nebula Award for Best Script. It was also one of the candidates for the Oscar for Best Animated Film, but lost to Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit. The production of the film was announced in September 2001, and it was originally in the hands of Mamoru Uzoda, who later came to direct several Japanese animated films such as The Girl Who Leapt Through Time, Wolf's Children and Belle. However, Ozoda ultimately gave up on the project, and the film's production only resumed in February 2003, this time under Miyazaki's leadership. Why did Ozoda leave Ghibli so abruptly? It's possible that the reason has to do with creative differences between Ozoda and the studio. Ozoda has talked about the experience in interviews, acknowledging that his time at the studio was a time of great challenges, but also a period of growth that helped shape his future works, such as those I just mentioned. In an interview with Polygon, Ozoda confesses that I was very excited, but at Ghibli, there are rules that have to be followed. I was told to make the movie similar to how Miyazaki would have made it, but I wanted to make my own movie. The difference between the movie I wanted to make and the one they wanted to make was too big, so I had to leave the project. If I had made Oz Moving Castle the way Ghibli wanted me to, I think my career would have ended. When I left the project, people thought, oh, it failed, it's over. But it's good that I went my own way, instead of doing something that Miyazaki would have done. And this is a very valid perspective. Of course, there is no way of knowing whether the split between Ghibli and Ozoda was on good terms, since that's private information. That hasn't stopped the internet from speculating widely on the subject. This particular rumor, that Ozoda has had a dislike for Miyazaki since the Owls Moving Castle situation was unearthed from its tomb when, during the 2021 Cannes Film Festival, Ozoda decided to make some comments about how the anime industry portrays female characters. And journalists rubbed their hands with glee because some of these comments seem to be directed at Miyazaki. If you read these articles, however, I suggest caution because most of them are biased and make it seem as if Ozoda said more than he actually did. His words were, I will not name him, but there is a great master of animation who always takes a young woman as his heroine. And to be frank, I think he does it because he does not have confidence in himself as a man. This veneration of young woman really disturbs me and I do not want to be a part of it. And from this, draw your own conclusions. The movie is based on a book written in 1986, also called Oz Moving Castle, born from the pen of a British author, Diana Wine Jones. The book in question is characterized by the author herself as being highly visual. 
This is, it prompts the reader to create a very clear image of what is being described. This aspect of the book is most likely what attracted Miyazaki and led him to create a film adaptation of the work. According to Toshio Suzuki, when Miyazaki read John's novel, his mind conjured up the image of a castle moving across the fields, and this image was truly inspiring. The book doesn't go into detail about how magic makes the castle move, and this question intrigued Miyazaki. And so the castle appeared in the form we are most familiar with, this inorganic being that walks on chicken legs. The solution Miyazaki arrived at when he asked himself how does the castle move, in a clear reference to the abode of the Slavic witch Baba Yaga. I've talked about Baba Yaga in my analysis of the movie Spirited Away, so this time I will just focus on what directly inspired Miyazaki. This is Baba Yaga's home. Baba Yaga's house is usually described as a small hut in the middle of the swamp, standing on chicken legs, sometimes one, in most versions two. It is possible that this idea arose from observing real houses built in the swamps, since houses that are built over water are supported by stilts, which from a distance can resemble birds' legs. In some stories, Baba Yaga's house is mobile, it walks on these legs, and the witch uses it to chase children in order to devour them. The rest of the details vary from version to version. In the story Vasilisa the Beautiful, the house is protected by a wall of human bones. Some describe the lock on the door as a mouth full of teeth. Many artists choose to depict the house as having one eye, usually above the door. Baba Yaga's house, therefore, is often represented almost as if it were an organism, something semi-organic, just like Miyazaki's walking castle. The complex castle we see in the movie is made up of more than 80 elements, including towers, a mechanical tongue, cogwheels, and much more, and as if that wasn't impressive enough, the castle changes shape and rearranges itself several times during the movie. As for the settings in the film, namely the hometown of Sophie, the protagonist, it is said that they were inspired by two towns in Alsace, France, Komar and Rikvir. Miyazaki visited these places to study the architecture of the buildings and their surroundings. Having also visited these places, I was left with the impression that the busiest streets, as well as the most notable buildings, were heavily influenced by Komar, but the narrow alleys that Sophie walks through at the beginning of the film are practically identical to those found in the smaller Rikvir. It is also said that both the work of Albert Robida and the Art of Illusion of 19th century Europe inspired Miyazaki during the creation of Owl's Moving Castle. Albert Robida was a French illustrator, cartoonist and novelist. He worked for 12 years as editor of the magazine La Caricature, but it is best known for the futurist trilogy he published between 1883 and 1890 and for the illustrations he did for La Guerre Infernale. When we look at Albert Hobbida's illustrations and compare them with some of the designs that appear in Oz Moving Castle, it's not hard to see the similarities. Both the backgrounds and the characters were drawn and painted by hand before being digitalized. Digital technology was also used to create copies of stills, and these steel frames were then retouched by hand. Diana Jones, the author of the book, was not involved in the creation of the movie. Miyazaki traveled to England in the summer of 2004 to show the film to Jones at a private screening. Jones expressed her support for the film. She was quoted as saying, It's fantastic. No, I have nothing to say. I write books, not movies. Yes, it's going to be different from the book. In fact, it's likely to be very different, but that's how it should be. It's going to be a fantastic movie. But no matter the differences between one and the other, the movie and the book are, to all intents and purposes, related. So it's important to talk a little about the author of the original version of the narrative. Diana Wine Jones was born in London in 1934. Like Miyazaki, she also suffered the effects of the Second World War during her childhood. When the war broke out, she was five years old, and as a result was evacuated to Wales. Successive changes marked her life from then on. In 1943, her family settled in Taxted, Essex. 
She attended St. Anne's College at Oxford University and attended lectures by important figures in the world of writing, such as Tolkien and Lewis. She knew from a very young age that she wanted to be a writer, but she only really started writing as an adult, in the mid of the 1960s, and shows children and young adults as her target audience. She gained international fame as a writer of children's fantasy books, although she also wrote books for adults, including some non-fiction. Her most popular stories include The Lives of Christopher Shant, Charmed Life, Conrad's Fate, The Ogre Downstairs, The Merlin Conspiracy, among others. Although her most popular book is, of course, Owl's Moving Castle, the first in a trilogy called The All Series. The idea that led her to create the story came from her visit to a school, where a boy asked her to write a tale about a castle that moved, and she liked the concept. Joan's writing was greatly influenced by her family situation, which was not good. Joan's had two younger sisters, and all three children were neglected by their parents, often forced to starve and sleep in poor conditions. Because of these experiences, her works include themes such as complicated family relationships, inept mothers, secret identities, time travel, climaxes that occur in crowds, and children who are imprisoned and then set free. Jones died in 2011 of lung cancer. Owl's Moving Castle was published in 1986 by Green Willow Books of New York. It was a runner-up for the Boston Globe Horn Book Award and won the Phoenix Award in 2006, two years after it was adapted into a movie by Miyazaki. As already mentioned, the book is the first in a trilogy. The other two titles are Castle in the Air, 1990, and House of Many Ways, 2008. In these two books, Sophie and All are not the main characters, but they are still present in the narrative and in ways that surprise the readers. The existence of these sequels sheds light on the future of our Ghibli couple, revealing what might have happened after the final scene of the movie, but we will talk about that later. Oz Moving Castle is considered by many to be a work of modern mythology, or new mythology, since it uses archetypes that also appear in fairy tales such as Cupid and Psyche, Cinderella, Bluebeard, and The Beauty and the Beast, but inverted. For example, Sophie is represented in the book as the eldest of three sisters, unlike in classical mythology, where the protagonist is usually the younger sister. The story adds a second layer of complexity by making this fact one of the origins of Sophie's low self-esteem. Since she knows that, as the eldest daughter, she is doomed to fail first. All expectations fall on her younger sister, whose name is Martha. The book never tells us why Sophie believes this. It doesn't tell us why this rule exists, but the reason can be found precisely in classical mythology. In tales such as those I mentioned earlier, it is always the youngest daughter who leaves the adventure, and the older sisters are often even portrayed as villains, serving as a symbol of envy. Another example can be found if we compare Owl's Moving Castle with The Beauty and the Beast, where the beauty is represented by Owl, who is young and attractive, and the beast is represented by Sophie, who is cursed and turned into an old woman. Old ladies in Western European mythology are commonly seen in a negative light, often portrayed as ugly and evil witches. And yet, Zone subverts this stereotype by turning the figure of the old woman into an heroine, more than that, it is the loss of her youth that allows Sophie to begin her journey and discover herself. And even when the curse is broken at the end of the story, the insight and wisdom that Sophie acquired during her time as an old woman remains, which is represented in the film by the fact that Sophie's hair does not return to its original color, but instead remains white. The subversion of stereotypes is not the only characteristic of new mythology that the book presents. In Owl's Moving Castle, the distinction between good and evil is often blurred, something Miyazaki appreciates, as we have already seen in Spirited Away. Both Owl and Sophie are characters with their fair share of flaws. Miyazaki goes even further in the movie by adding the redemption of the Witch of the Waste, which doesn't occur in the book. 
In short, the, this absence of the good versus evil is also a characteristic of modern mythology. Finally, the last reason why the story is singled out as a work of new mythology is due to John's use of a phenomenon called heterotopia. Heterotopia is a concept developed by philosopher Michel Foucault that is used to describe certain cultural, institutional and discursive spaces that are in some way disturbing, intense, incompatible, contradictory or transformative. In other words, worlds within other worlds. Foucault uses the term to describe spaces that have more layers or relationships with other places than those that are immediately visible. Prior to my research, I didn't know that this phenomenon had a name, and the funny thing is that I use heterotopia in one of my trilogies. In the first book, the story takes place in a fantastic world, and in that world, there are allusions to another dimension that people call ether, and to the gods who live in that dimension. But it's only in the second book that we come to realize that Ether is actually our world and that the gods mentioned are us. And in the third book, the characters go beyond the metaphorical barrier and appear here. But anyway, back to the topic. The heterotopia that Zones uses in Owl's Moving Castle is very similar. There is a point in the story when the castle door opens and Sophie discovers another world, which is Wales, Owl's homeland. I will talk more about this in an upcoming video, don't worry. For now, all you need to know is that in the book there is this connection between our universe and the fantastic, but in the movie none of this is mentioned. In the next video, I will compare the events in the movie with the events in the book. I will explain the decisions made, point out references to what it works, talk a little about each character and so on. But I would like to show you already in this video how the movie differs from the book in the broadest sense. The first half of the movie tells the story as it appears in the book. There are changes, of course, including parts that are deleted, but the situations that occur are essentially the same. What changes is the perspective from which we see these situations, as if the same forest was being filmed from different angles. In the second half of the movie, the small differences culminate in a radical change of direction, and the two stories take different paths. <clears throat> and yet, Miyazaki continues to make references to the book again and again, some more obvious, others more subtle. Dialogues that belong to the book appear in different contexts, characters merge to give rise to something new, and spells are used for different purposes. You will see what I mean, it's super interesting, you will see. The biggest differences between the movie and the book, however, especially when it comes to the first half, are mainly thematic. The book challenges class and gender norms and focuses on the development of Sophie and all characters. Jones takes us on an adventure with the protagonist and makes us observe how she learns to accept herself and how she finds a family. These aspects are still present in the movie, but this one focuses more on love in all its forms loyalty and the destructive effects of war. This last point is what most distinguishes it from its counterpart. In Zone's version, there are hardly any allusions to the impending war, which is merely a plot device. But in Miyazaki's version, war is always present, as an evil that haunts the characters, and in the second half of the movie it becomes a central point of the story. In other words, Miyazaki chose to portray the movies as a love story amid war, rather than a story driven by the development of the characters. I thought Jones and Miyazaki lived their childhoods during the Second World War, Jones tends not to include the subject of war in her books, while Miyazaki never misses an opportunity to draw the public's attention to the subject. Miyazaki said in an interview with the US magazine Newsweek in June 2005 that Oz Moving Castle was influenced by the conflict that began the year before the film's release, on March 20, 2003, with the invasion of Iraq. The conflict as a whole became known as the Iraq War, or the occupation of Iraq. The 2003 invasion of Iraq dubbed Operation Iraqi Freedom by the United States, was the first stage of what would become a long conflict, which would only end on December 18, 2011, with the withdrawal of American troops from Iraqi territory after eight years of occupation. 
For this operation, the Americans received military support from the United Kingdom, Australia and Poland. According to US President George Bush and UK Prime Minister Tony Blair, the coalition's mission was to disarm the Iraqi regime and Saddam Hussein's support for terrorist organizations and liberate the Iraqi people. I won't go into detail about this war because it's not within the scope of this video nor it is a part of Japanese history, but one day I might create a channel about world history. Until then, you will have to do your own research if you're curious. I will just say that this decision by the United States led to a lot of controversy. Well, Miyazaki identifies as a pacifist. In 2003, he was invited to receive an Oscar in the United States for the creation of the film Spirited Away, but decided not to attend the ceremony. Years later, he revealed to the LA Times that he didn't go because he didn't want to visit a country that was bombing Iraq, but that this was something he couldn't share at the time because his producer wouldn't allow it. Miyazaki then decided that Oz Moving Castle would take an anti-war stance. In principle, the film should have provoked a certain unease among American audiences, and so the director was of the opinion that Oz Moving Castle would be poorly received in the United States. But was Oz Moving Castle really poorly received in the United States compared to the other Ghibli films? You already know the answer to that. Oz Moving Castle was a hit in the United States. It won a Nebula Award for Best Screenplay and almost led to Miyazaki winning another Oscar. It appeared on many lists of the 10 best films of 2005 in magazines such as LA Weekly, Los Angeles Times, The Charlotte Observer, The Chicago Tribune and The Baltimore Sun. The reason the movie was so successful, contrary to Miyazaki's expectations, is due to the subtlety of its meshes. The themes and interests behind the war in Old Moving Castle are not extensively explored. Miyazaki may have had the Iraq war in mind while creating the film, but the anti-war message applies to any conflict, regardless of space or time. And the vast majority of people agree that war is a bad thing. This combined with the fact that Miyazaki's villains are usually complex people capable of chains makes it very difficult for anyone watching the movie to feel personally offended. Besides, not all Americans were in favor of the invasion of Iraq, so for many, knowing that this connection exists doesn't spoil the experience of the film in any way. Finally, since we have talked about the film's connection with war, we have to conclude this video by mentioning an important associated theme that also appears in Owl's Moving Castle, the action of flying. As a child, Miyazaki was fascinated by military aircraft, but his innocent admiration was contaminated by his awareness of the destructive power of these machines. Thus, in Owl's Moving Castle, aviation is shown as something beautiful and worthy of admiration, but also as something ugly and destructive, which can be used by strategists and rulers to cause harm. The act of flying represents a common dream. Flying represents freedom. Humanity as a whole, for hundreds of years, has always wanted to fly. But when that dream was achieved, very quickly the newly acquired power began to be used for military purposes. This dichotomy inspires Miyazaki, who, is, who in an interview with Any America, in 1997 said, at one time flying was also something that only happened in the world of imagination, which shows the affection he feels for this subject. And that's all for now, I hope to see you in my next video. I don't know if I will be able to cover all aspects of the book and the movie in one video, I will probably need two. I didn't want this analysis to be as long as that of Spirited Away, but when there's stuff to say, there's stuff to say. Nothing I can do about it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to leave your support and take care and see you soon.